In this series, I will discuss PC hardware that has become legendary for both positive and negative reasons. And the best one I felt like starting with is the legendary AMD FX9590, the first consumer CPU that shipped with a 5 GHz clock speed out of the box. To know what made the 9590 such a legend, we need to look at what AMD was offering before it and what Intel was offering as competition at the time. AMD launched their 32 nanometer bulldozer based CPUs on October 12, 2011 marketing it as a brand new design built from the ground up with impressive performance per watt on their AM3 Plus platform. Many CPUs were offered from quad cores all the way up to 8 core CPUs with either 95 watt or 125 watt TDPs depending on the model with the FX8150 being a very popular choice for a lot of users out there. Clock speeds were decent for the time but nothing exceptional but being that they were all unlocked, this allowed many people to gain much higher clock speeds, giving much improved performance, although this came with higher power use and required decent cooling for the most part. In October of the next year, AMD released the successor to Bulldozer, Piledriver. Improvements were incremental, mainly improving power consumption and clock speeds, but most reviewers and consumers just saw it as a small step forward for AMD. Even so, the FX8350, the successor to the 8150, did gain popularity as a value for money 8 core CPU and was popular with some overclockers too. It should also be noted that the FX6300 was seen as a very good value for money CPU at the time, even more so than the 8350. And the fact that all the CPUs were unlocked always sat well with the enthusiasts who were annoyed and frustrated at Intel by limiting overclocking to only the K models of their CPUs. Speaking of Intel, they were busy during the same time period too. While Bulldozer was hitting the shelves, Intel had its own legend already out, Sandy Bridge. These CPUs are by far their own legend, and I will do a whole video on Sandy Bridge in the future. But considering that many still think of it as Intel's last big step forward, it's fair to say that Sandy Bridge was a big launch for Intel. The 32 nanometer LGA1155 mainstream CPUs featured dual core, four thread i3s, quad core, 4-thread i5s and quad-core 8-thread i7s including the absolutely legendary i7-2600K and the slightly higher clocked 2700K which I owned for a number of years and I absolutely loved that CPU. Although the Intel CPUs lacked the core count of their AMD rivals, they had a huge advantage in single-threaded performance. And although they slightly lacked stock clock speeds compared to their AMD counterparts, they performed better in most gaming situations, especially once overclocked, although the AMD CPUs did perform well in many productivity applications. Similar to AMD, Intel followed up Sandy Bridge about a year later with Ivy Bridge. This saw a die shrink down to 22 nanometer, but was more or less an incremental upgrade over Sandy Bridge with IPC gains of about 5% and core counts and clock speeds remaining basically the same as Sandy Bridge. The stage was set then and AMD decided to try and hit back at Intel and what they delivered certainly created a splash within the tech community, although maybe not the one they really wanted. Super quickly guys, I just want to let you know that this video is sponsored by PriceBuy.co.nz. So this is a fantastic website. You can compare the pricing on any different model of GPU or CPU that you're after, or any PC hardware for that matter, from all the stores in New Zealand. And they have an app that you can download on your Android or iOS phone, so then when you're out and about, you can compare pricing on the fly. So definitely check them out. Links are in the description down below. In the summer of 2013, AMD launched the FX9590 and FX9370 CPUs, which featured stunningly high clock speeds for the time, but also a VRM melting 220 watt TDP since the 9590's default CPU voltage was set at 1.5 volts, which resulted in only a handful of AM3 Plus motherboards being able to handle the 9590 without burning down your house. 
At first, it was only offered to OEMs, before finally being able to be purchased by itself, although it was often bundled with a high-end CPU cooler and or a motherboard, which was smart considering that some people really didn't understand what cooling was required, which resulted in CPU cooler manufacturers labeling many coolers as 220 watt TDP compatible to help consumers out. The 9590 could be overclocked, but not very far, and usually required an absolute unit of a CPU cooler or LN2 if you were going to go super crazy. So generally, most people didn't overclock it. And it did make sense to those who didn't or couldn't overclock a CPU themselves. Now they had a 5 GHz CPU right out of the box. Then there comes the price. At launch, the 9590 was 900 US dollars which is absolutely insane given that the 8350, which is essentially the same CPU with lower clock speeds, was selling for $700 less at $200 US dollars. This astronomical price was soon reduced to $300 US dollars, which is much more reasonable and matched the price of the 3770K. But it makes me feel sorry for those that shelled out all that money at the initial price point. But what about the performance then? Surely it was unstoppable considering that it had 8 cores and a turbo speed of 5 GHz. Well, you would be wrong. Cinebench is widely viewed as one of the most unbiased ways to measure a CPU's multi-threaded and single-threaded performance and it is often used in marketing material by both Intel and AMD. According to LegitReviews.com, the 9590 scores a shocking 717 CB in the multi-threaded test and only 113 CB in a single-threaded test. You can see compared to the stock 2700K, it gets matched in multi-threaded and destroyed in single-threaded performance. For reference, if you put the 9590 up against the Ryzen 7 2700X and the Intel i9 9900 today, this is how it would compare. Yeah, not very good. <laughs> but that's just a synthetic benchmark I hear you say. What about gaming? Well, in games it fared even worse, and it really showed how far behind Intel AMD was in those days. People really shouldn't forget how huge of a step Ryzen was for AMD. The difference in IPC compared to Pile Driver is absolutely huge. However, it does need to be said that the 9590, for all its marketing hype, was ultimately a failure. It just couldn't compare to what Intel was offering, and the difference in power usage alone was enough to make many people question the decision on whether to buy one or not. So why is it considered a legend then? For many of us computer enthusiasts, 5 GHz has always been the dream CPU clock speed. Lots of people push their 2600Ks as far as they would go in trying to hit that magical clock speed. Plenty more try to do the same with their AMD processors too, but more often than not, the CPUs just couldn't get there, especially given the motherboards of the time. It seemed like something that we could only dream about hitting by winning the silicon lottery, and then along came the 9590, which promised you a 5 GHz clock speed right out of the box without any of the worries about voiding your warranty or killing your CPU. On paper, it would have seemed like a great deal, and the marketing around it certainly hyped it up, but in reality, it was all noise and no substance. Still, it became a legend because it was the first CPU to deliver a 5 GHz clock speed right out of the box, and also because of all the memes and jokes it spawned given its high levels of heat and huge power usage, which further cemented it into legendary status, although not for the reasons that AMD would have hoped for. To this day, it is still a CPU that I can remember and remember well, I sit here making this video with my Intel i9-9900K, which is an 8-core CPU that can turbo to 5 GHz out of the box. And I wonder at the fact that just a few years ago, in 2014, it seemed like a huge deal to have an 8-core with such clock speeds. It really shows how far we've come and how fast the technology moves. We shouldn't take for granted what we have now, and we should often look back at the CPUs and hardware of the past to really see what we used to have and how much better things have gotten now compared to back then. 
I hope you all have enjoyed this video. I will continue this series if you've enjoyed it, so please let me know in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.